I just want to start out sincerely thanking the organizers. This has been a fantastic meeting, not least because of Yap's talk. I am so happy to come after it. And I really want to, uh, uh, I have a little speech I wrote during his talk <laughs> about what's going on between our different talks. I mean, from the uh, introduction to Yap, I assume that I am the uh, person who looks like R2-D2, but it's actually C-3PO because I'm the reactionary. Um, however, in fact, I, you know, I agree with Yap almost everything until the very end there. And I think the, mis the difference I have with both of you gentlemen is uh, that I'm an engineer. And I, and I think that, that you guys have so much clarity. And I, I really admire both of you about how you got through the, the legal and ethical reasoning from a logical perspective. I come to the exact same place more from a theoretical biology perspective. So I'm going to be basically arguing from the same thing. But, but what's beautiful, and why I wanted you to come back in, was this argument about the that there's no difference. The difference is a discretization between a corporation and a machine. Because a corporation is composed of people still. And I know there's problems with laws about exactly how it's being distributed. And I think AI is actually increasing this. That's the title of my talk. OK, this is getting to my talk. Um, but the point is that there's no coherent unit of artificial intelligence. There's no particular thing that we could tax or particular thing that we could do retribution against. Because if whatever thing that you make up, um, that that's what the law is. It's like when, when they said in, in Britain, oh, let's tax rich people by taxing the number of windows on the houses. Well, then they bricked up the windows, right? Whatever thing you come up with, we can build AI that will avoid that thing and make it look like we don't deserve any taxes. So it's very important that we keep it at the corporate level. Um, and, and I just want, okay, so you can go back and talk in the corridor, but I just wanted to say that is the fundamental problem. Um, I will also make AI a second order moral patient later on. I totally agree with Yap that we could build AI that would meet all these things. But what I'm saying is as soon as, the, because it is built, because it is engineered, it's not evolved. That's why as soon as you give us, uh, us, the engineers, a gradient, we will follow that gradient and we will evade your taxation. And I think we can see this already happening with Google and Facebook. All right, so now. I am going to be a little different from you. Please only interrupt me if, you, if I'm being really unclear, because I'm going to try to motor through a whole ton of slides. And then, who, where's my, where's my uh, hostess, the person who introduced me? Yeah. Can you warn me when 35 minutes are up? And then I'm going to skip to the end and give you five reasons not to other uh, machines, not to try to create them as corporate, besides the one I just gave you, which I hadn't thought of before. So, <laughs> OK. All right, so here we go. Oh my god, this is not working at all. This is not good. Okay, let me read it to you. Artificial intelligence is here now, actively changing what it means to be human. Okay, I hope that color doesn't come too often. Yeah, here it is. And so we need to get real, right? I, there's way too much stuff about saying, oh, in a thousand years it might be like this. No, the stuff is here now, and, and we do, I don't want to push it off into the future. So let's hope this uh, applies up. All right, there's at least three things going on. Engineering is telling us about ways to change the world. So if you think about from a policy perspective, we're creating new possibilities of what policies are. And you can think from a philosophical perspective of that as being ontological. Science is telling us about the world. It allows us to predict consequences of the policies, OK? So that's called descriptive within philosophy. I'm using the philosophical terms here. The, um, and I, the, this talk is mixing science and it's mixing science with, with the humanities. And I'm going to try to be clear to flag that up, but if you have any questions, go ahead and ask me. The humanities, or, or, or if you want to say government, um, coordinates the policy making. All right? So some of these questions are normative, and some of them are descriptive. What I just did was take something that was sort of a normative argument and said, but there's a descriptive consequence. And that's what I'm going to be doing in this talk. I'm going to try to make it clear when we dance back and forth between those. But I think one of the reasons you get mistakes is when people don't notice that they're hopping between these two levels and this ontological thing, that they don't realize that there could be totally new things. And then there's some things that we, we just can't build for, for uh, logical uh, reasons. All right, so I'm going to go through a, a set of really brutal functionalist uh, definitions. I don't mean to say that this is how this word is used. As we discussed yesterday, some people use intelligence to mean moral patient. 
For me, I'm going to use moral patience to mean use moral patient to mean moral patient, and I'm going to use intelligence to mean doing the right thing at the right time in a dynamic environment. So yes, animals, humans, and machines can all be intelligent. All right. And what this requires is a set of contexts that can be perceived, a set of actions that can be performed, and associations between these. So recognizing the appropriate context. All of these are things that can be learned. Actions can include sensing directly, but this, the context recognition, um, a lot of what we do with our brains is basically uh, clustering to figure out, oh, that's, I've just discriminated that in this context I should wear a white tie and in this one I should use a black tie. Right? That, that I, I didn't know there were two different kinds of weddings before, now I do, for example. All right. General intelligence is a myth. The, the, so this is another word that people use to mean moral patient or a uh, terrible thing that's going to take over the world. But humans don't have general intelligence. Animals don't have general intelligence. The behaviorists in the early 20th century thought that you could connect any sense to any action. But you can condition a pigeon to peck all kinds of things in order to get seed, to get food. And you can condition a pigeon to flap its wings to escape a shock to its feet. But you cannot condition a pigeon to flap its wings for food or to peck to escape shock. Right? Our brains are compartmental. They're mar they, we, we already have biological predispositions about what we can and can't learn. And that is also what we do when we architect AI. We, that's why you don't need to worry about a chess machine that's going to notice that you turn off the power, like the Future of Humanity Institute likes to talk about, right? You don't put a camera on a chess machine. Or if you do, you point it at the chessboard, right? So nobody's going to notice, no, no machine is going to notice about, a ch no chess machine will notice about the, you know, somebody turning off the machine. All right? So find, sorry that this is not showing up on this projector. Finding the right thing to do at the right time is a form of search. And the fundamental problem of search is combinatorics. Okay, so I'm going to do a whirlwind because I know I don't have much time. Imagine there's only two things you can do. You know, move your right hand or move your left hand. If you only have one move, then you have two possible things. If you do two moves, you have four possible things, eight, 16. You get the idea. And this is such a powerful form of growth that you can get from two cells to a baby in nine months. All right? It is inconceivable how many things we could be doing, even though we often sit around and can't think of any. Actually, it's, inc it's inconceivably vast space. This is the same kind of argument if you had 100 actions. A two-step plan, you already have 10,000 possible plans. All right? That's exponential explosion. Um, and of course, we actually live in a world where we don't know how many steps. Right? So if I was trying to go to Paris, I might eat, sleep, work, eat, sleep, work, eat, sleep, work, and never get a passport. Right? So that's, that's the combinatorial space. And Humans can't solve this. AI can't solve this entirely. There are more possible 30, uh, you know, 30 or 35 short games of chess than there are atoms in the universe. Okay? You can't just do a lookup table in AI and solve those kinds of problems. Okay, so, so how does machine learning happen? Why do we suddenly have driverless cars? That's amazing, right? It's because it's exploiting existing search. And you can't see this, but it says, so does human culture. That's why we have the laptops and the chimpanzees don't. Because we figured out a way to communicate. Yeah, the, 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 neither, these are what are in my yard. I couldn't take a picture of a chimpanzee in my yard. So <laughs> the Blue Jays, pretty smart, no laptops. We're the ones with the laptops because we're the ones with language because we transmit and retain more and more useful information than any other species. And what we started to figure out how to do recently is to do this with AI, all right? So we've gotten very good at taking the, the computation that's already happened and sticking it into our machines, all right? So basically, AI is yet another way that humans are processing and extending the subset of information we've already figured out, OK? And that, yes, this is extending what it means to be human. We are, we are accelerating the rate at which we discover things because we're using machines to help us. By having, we're also accelerating that rate by having mobile phones and better nutrition and 7 billion people that are getting better educations, right? Human knowledge and AI are both forms of computation. And they're, they're both doing search, and they're both massively changing things. And now, this is the part I love. I'm going to be empirical. I can actually prove this. Well, at least I can give you a pretty good example of it. 
Do you guys know about large corpus semantics? This is how, like, when you type in five words into Google or two words and you get an entire web page back, right? How does it figure out what you want to do? So it was, it was done in the 90s initially. People were figured out that you could run statistics off of a large corpus, which means like lot, a lot of words. It takes a lot of words. But we all, as, as, as children, are exposed to a lot of words. So all you have to do is record the co-occurrence of words, the ones that are, occur near each other. And then if you say, um, so like you say you keep a, a vector. So you, you keep count of 75 of the, sec the second 75 most common words. And you basically uh, uh, sum up whether or not the two words occur next to each other. Okay. Words that have similar looking vectors, which you can measure with a cosine back from geography, right? That they have fairly similar vectors mean pretty much the same thing. So you can find it's a, it's a disembodied meaning. It's not rooted in real experience. But then you can tie a few things into real experience, and you've got your grounding. So you don't ground all the words. So anyway, in the, I want to emphasize this. This is now called word embeddings. We didn't call it that in the 90s. Um, it doesn't mean that artificial and intelligence means the same thing. What it means is that if you appear in similar contexts. So if we have artificial flowers and artificial intelligence, then that means intelligence and flowers could be somehow more similar than some other random word. Uh, so the simplest hypothesis here is that meaning is exactly its usage. So this goes back to the kind of move that Yaf was making about, the, um, about uh, that consciousness is, is exactly the, the experience of, of an action selection. All right. So, what we used to do was, uh, was validate semantic modules against uh, priming. So how quickly, th th this is actually kind of complicated. But basically, you use human, human subjects and try to get them to do a task. And, and judging by how quickly they do the task, you think, well, the words must mean closer to the same thing. Because again, how did we know what our, we, what is our ground truth? How do we know if the machine uh, semantics is approaching human semantics? We have to have some kind of ground truth. Well, yeah, so people drew figures like this. What we've done, and now this is an archive, it's, I don't think any of us are journalists, but this is only for academic release now because it's under submission to an embargoed publication. Um, but we're not using the old way. What we're using is something called the implicit association task. So have people heard of the implicit association task? There's a few nods. There weren't enough nods that I won't sort of explain it. The idea is it's something you could go online and try yourself um, it's, it's that it's easier, unfortunately, we're all racist and we're all sexist. And it's easier for us to associate things like boys with math and girls with reading uh, because we associate, than it is for us to associate girls with math and boys with reading. I actually saw a great presentation about this, which was just about associating right with good and left with bad. And it's a million times faster to tap your hand every time you hear your right hand when you hear good and your left hand when you hear bad than to do it the other way around. Because, and that, you know, our culture no longer believes that the left is, is controlled by the devil like the Romans believed, but it's still sufficiently pervasive in our culture that we have, we, that this is much easier. Okay, so this stuff is extremely well uh, published. Everybody was up in arms about it. You know, people log in and do it all the time online. You guys can too. So we took this as the, um, as the ground truth about semantics. And we then, uh, I already sort of said this. And then, yeah, you use the reaction times as the measure. So we use this as the ground truth. And then we looked at uh, natural language corpus semantics. And we used, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll just skip this, because I know I have a lot to do, cover. I'll come, I'll come back to that, actually. OK. So we used an absolutely bog standard. In fact, we used a couple. Um, but but the, the Google, there's Google tools, but we use the Stanford tools here, mostly because they had the largest corpus. So we're talking about 840 billion words, of which 2.2 million were unique. Okay, so you can't really get many statistics if you only have a word that occurs once. So that was the largest corpus we could find. We didn't modify it in any way. This is something that people use all the time in their AI tools and apps. And, um, and actually, we, we, you can sit on the Google uh, 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 main page and get some of, reproduce some of our results. Uh, it's, it's pretty fun. Well, mostly on translate, it's actually easiest. Okay, so going back to this, what we're looking for, we're not, is 
how, how similar are, say, female names to math words, and um, sorry, this should be male names to reading words, uh, versus uh, male names to math words, and, and uh, yeah, that, yeah, sorry, I just noticed this is completely wrong. This is like the third time I've shown this slide. It's Arvin's slide, it's not my fault. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so, the, so it's going to be faster to associate female names with reading words and male names with math words than it is to associate male names with, uh, with reading words and, and female names with math words. And what we measure is two things. One is the distance between the two standard deviations of, over those words. And then the other is uh, the, uh, the size of the effect. So, so, what, what, so the, we, we measure the distance in terms of standard deviations, all right, so which are which is labeled with D. And then we already know that for humans, these are gigantic. This is not one of those things where you get like, you know, you have 2,000 people in the lab and you get 0.5, right? We get, we get huge D, and we also, we also look at the probability that the sets of the terms are the same, and we report a p-value for that, OK? So um, let's, let's go through this. Yeah, like I said, everything is off the shelf, we did, so we couldn't have introduced the bias ourselves. All right, so here, the, because this stuff was so controversial, Greenwald et al. initially uh, started out with something nobody cares about very much, which is the idea that flowers are pleasant, and insects are unpleasant. And so again, what we have is a set of words that are associated with flowers, a set of words that are associated with insects, and then a set of words uh, associated with pleasantness, and a set of words associated with unpleasantness. And uh, th well, <laughs> the results are, are simple. But here's the original finding. With just 32 people, they had this incredibly strong result. This is huge for psychology. And using the entire web, we get about the same, uh, actually strikingly similar uh, effect sizes and certainties. Um, unfortunately, this extends to race, all right? So again, we replicate um, using the same words. And um, my uh, co-author, Eileen, uh, had the idea of also looking at the resume study. You know this famous resume study uh, where um, they sent out the same resume, but with black or white names on it, and the white names got 50% more offers for interviews. All right, so we using those set of names, we also got the same kind of replication if you assume that being less pleasant means you get fewer invitations. All right, we also replicated for the gender biases. So this is about, um, you know, that women are more associated with family and men are more associated with careers. Um, also, that uh, women are more associated with arts and men are more associated with science. And uh, yeah, I want, that's right. We, there's some more. If you want, go ahead and look at the paper. It's, on, it's an archive. But I want to point out from AI, this is machine learning mining visceral facts you know, of, about human qualia, like that we find insects unpleasant with no direct experience of the world, that we can just get that from statistically acquiring nearness of words, right? Nearness, similarity of the context of words, all right? So if we can do some machine learning, I could cross off the machine there and just say learning can do this, all right? And that's what some of the people that argued against the embodied theory of language pointed out that you can't discriminate blind people from sighted people by their speech. This might be why. They can just absorb this kind of information, even if they've never had the quality of, of vision. So, Weirdly, the exact same process mines vertical information. So this is, uh, Arvind was very freaked out by the strength, and he's a, a associate, an assistant professor who's up for tenure at, at, at Princeton, so he was very nervous. I mean, he was very excited, but very nervous. And he said, look, I want to look at this stuff for something we know is true. So on the y-axis here, we have how male or female, um, the same thing that was showing the prejudice, rates a particular term. Okay, now on this side is about uh, jobs. I was horrified to find out that programming is now only 2% of programmers are, are uh, female. When I was a programmer, it was like 5%. But anyway, so yeah, one of these dots over here is, is programmer. So these are jobs, and w we just took it from the 2015 US labor statistics, and then we looked up the words um, in, in our thing about how male or female they are, 90% correlation. All right, so we can say that it's prejudice to refer to a doctor as he before we know 
whether it's a male or a female. But it's also likely to be true. Doctors are, doctors are around here, OK? So the, um, and this over here is not a careers. This is just about names. So like Kelly or Chris, names that both men and women, Alex, might have. And this time, we only get at 84%. But that, as you guys who are familiar with science know, that's huge. And that's the 1990 census. I'm sure if we could get a more recent census. Notice this was the entire web. One of the things this shows you is that the US, America is dominating the English language web, and that the present is dominating the web, which we knew that there's this doubling of words on the web every year or something like that. So, so the 1990 thing is just archaic. And I think we could do better if we could get a more recent census that, that told us gender of names. All right. So at least, again, local to this talk, um, I'm going to call bias expectations derived from experience re experienced, it should be experienced, regularities in the world. OK? So bias in machine learning is something you want. It's, 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 it is actually what you are learning. You're learning about regularities in the world. Um, stereotype, and the, the original paper that you find in archive got this wrong. I got corrected at a political science conference. <laughs> Stereotype is biases based on regularities we no longer wish to persist. And what I had originally called that in the paper was uh, prejudice. But it turns out that prejudice is when you act on a stereotype. So anyway, the point is that whether you call it a stereotype or whether you call it prejudice, this is culturally determined. The machine is picking up what is actually going on in the world, and, and which is coming out of our experience, right? In this case, because it's based on language. The machines are picking up what's going on in the world, and, and probably we are too. But we culturally determine that it is not OK to say that women uh, can't be doctors or whatever. right? So that's something that an algorithm can't discriminate. Uh, yeah, and there we go, prejudice acting on stereotypes. So the implications here is the AI based on human culture won't be neutral. It's not going to magically come out of Plato's cave and, and, and help us all become a better species. It's part of our culture. It is just us. Right? It's something we've built. And as I said before, that's necessary because computation takes time, energy, and space. Computation is not math. It's not something that can live in a cave. All right? Also, we have to construct the AI to recognize and address biases we label prejudiced. Again, for those of us who are engineers, uh, the paper actually recommends at the end that we have modular architectures to handle the, these two different kinds of information. It also gives you a new null hypothesis for human prejudice. So that some of it derives out of observed regularities. And what's happening is whether or not you're taking on board some of the normative information about whether or not we accept those. But if that's true, what's going on with the racism? All right. So this is something that, that is uh, very concerning to us and still an open question. But this is the most recent guess. Greenwald also had exactly the same problem, Greenwald et al., when they uh, published their original paper. And so they actually went to Korea, as you do when you have a real problem. Um, <laughs> they, they went to Korea, and they checked, and Japan. And they found that using the same set of names, if they were in Korea, the Koreans found the Japanese less pleasant. If they're in Japan, they found the Korean names less pleasant. Okay? So it seems like it's a form of parochialism. But what's disturbing is that African Americans show similar associations to European Americans. It's weaker. But it's still a very strong effect. That, so they also find uh, African American names unpleasant. So we think what's going on here, but we're not sure, is that, that um, race is just one identity indicator. And identification with a dominant group might be what's pleasant. Right? So rather than, weirdly, it's not identifying like, oh, that's me. It's identifying like, oh, that's something from the dominant group. I, that would be a good place to be. All right. Um, and we have a little tiny bit of. Uh, evidence about this, but we decided to leave it out as a submitted version unless the uh, reviewers ask for it. So, um, but so basically, the pleasantness is a better, fortunately, the, the guys with the resume study actually had a per name uh, probability of callback. And so we were able to tell that pleasantness is actually a stronger predictor than African Americanness. I'm not entirely sure how, you dis how that's discriminated, but anyway, it was. Um, and also, both of those are stronger than frequency, which was one of the things I thought was that the African American names are just lower frequency. So I would like to run this with European names that don't occur frequently in America, like, I don't know, you know Ian and Nigel. You know. <laughs> um, so, so we'll see. 
Anyway, this is a little bit off the, the main point of my talk, so I just want to make a summary around the semantics result. Human culture is expressed in text as a sufficient signal to pick up regularities about human society and experience. All right? AI should be modular like brains in order that we could sort of handle things. Yeah, as I said, uh, uh, we automatically want to absorb this information. We probably need to know that, that there's an issue with not enough female programmers. But we need to be able to explicitly learn new instructions. For example, don't say that. Right? This isn't something that, that's shaping society in the way we want to shape it. Uh, the, the White House, uh, the US has had a series of AI initiatives this, really recently, I don't even want to say this year, it was like sort of June and July, where, and the White House's concerns, the, the out, unfortunately outgoing White House, was that we shouldn't consolidate now using uh, statistics um, things that are a consequence of 300 years of bad policy. That's a nice way to phrase it. So this is talking about regularities that came out of the past, and we get to choose as a culture if we want to change from the past to the future. All right. So you, want to, you may want to learn, the, learn a list of prejudices that you shouldn't express. All right, so I, I, this is supposed to be my title. And this thing that you can't see, I, I'll, I'll skip over that. But let's get back to the main title about, about how is this changing humans. So I, the whole first part of my talk there was just about communicating what AI really is. All right, um, that it was, it's not some, you know, some particular dog-like thing that you can tax, right? <laughs> It's, it's a process, right? And, and uh, so there's, and I'm going to argue that there's nothing magic about any of these things that we couldn't build into a machine, all right? Um, and I also have argued already that artificial and natural intelligence are, are isomorphic, okay? They're just computation. When people talk about the intelligence expression, they say, but isn't it going to change when AI can learn to change itself? which it sort of already does, again, to disagree with the very, that very end conversation. You know, Google does update every time you, it gives you a bunch of words and you go to the second page and click on something, you have, you know, Google updates itself and says, oops, that was, that was bad. Okay, so there already is self-modification, AI all over the place. But look, here's the, here's the intelligence explosion, right? Humanity is different because we use artifacts. And, and this is our unanticipated sub-goal. We're destroying the rest of the ecosystem, right? I don't know how many of you know Bostrom, but this is one of his, his claim was that we were going to turn, um, we're, you know, that the AI might accidentally turn, turn the planet into paper clips or something. But in fact, we're accidentally out competing all the other species and just wiping them out. There's actually more biomass on the planet since we started uh, mining out oil and coal and stuff like that. So there's more plants and there's more animals but all the, large, the, the, all the large animals you can see, the megafauna, are reducing in number except the ones we own. And if this is a little too complicated, here's the XKCD version. All right? So the green is all that's left of wild animals. And this was like eight years ago. And this is getting devastated. So um, this is humans. These are cows. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're changing everything into cows and apes. All right? These over here are sheep and goats and things, dogs and cats, stuff like that. OK. So if we accept that intelligence can be decomposed, so motivation, action, memory, learning, and reasoning, then we could argue that every, that every machine, especially writing, has been an example of AI. Um, so AI enhances human power. And in that case, we've had 12,000 years, which is why it's OK to talk about this being the intelligence explosion. All right, the, it, AI does aggravate that. OK. But now that my main point was that AI and ICT more general, the, the communication of our information with each other, is changing humanity. So what we know from theoretical biology is that when you have more communication, you start acting more like a group. It increases group level investment is the way it's referred to. Okay. So um, I think we can see this. One example that I pulled out, I had a chapter about this called Artificial Intelligence and Pro-Social Behavior. Now we just think of pro-social behavior as good, right? That's culture directing us up to social investment. That's what cult culture is, a social investment. So it's not surprising we see more push that direction. But, but pro-sociality, um, here's one, just one example that's very well studied, uh, is that if you look at the way parenting has changed in the last 30 years, not only are the kids' lives entirely micromanaged, so they can't find their own way home because they're never allowed to, 
But also, I hear this is not true in Poland. Good. <laughs> we, we need some humans that know how to find their own way home. Um, but also, uh, the, the, um, the parents are losing like 15 or 20 percent of their the free time they used to have, the, the 1970s parents compared to t 2010 parents. So this is a huge, oh, that's 40 years, well, whatever. <laughs> okay. So I would argue that in both cases, you're probably getting much more organized families, and, and there has been a reduce in, in crime, although it wasn't that high in the first place. But it's, it is massively lower now. But, um, but the consequence is that the individuals have less liberty. Um, and there's this other thing that we're, it's hard to discriminate where companies end. And I think there's huge issues in here in terms of revenues for, for companies. right? Basically, we are all doing research for Google. Google is only paying some tax in America and not on every one of these transactions. There's all these two-way transactions where we give information and they give information, right? And we're all happy about that. I'm not a Google basher. I think Google is great. But I think it's changing what it means to be human, <laughs> as I said. And in particular, it's changing what it means to do taxation and what the boundaries of a nation state are. So, um, but also, we're doing our own uh, telling. Uh, in terms of un uh, unemployment, very quickly, because I haven't been told that I'm out of time yet. Oh, I should keep going. There's a lot of slides. Um, well, anyway, I'll tell you since I started. There's, since, we have, since we had the, the automatic teller machines, there's way fewer tellers per branch of a bank. Because, and they don't do the routine stuff anymore. But there's actually more tellers overall. And the reason is because branches became cheaper, so banks added way more branches. So that, this whole thing about employment is, is tricky. Anyway, oh, I am, I am getting there. OK, so where, where's my view? Yeah, how am I doing? How much time do I have left? Oh, OK. <laughs> I told you to let me 10 minutes. OK, so othering AI, all right. So when I say othering, I mean things like saying the robot is doing this. The AI is learning that, or the robot is doing this. And of course, when people say that I'm racist, because I, I don't consider robots to be, uh, <laughs> to be human. Um, OK, there's a shockingly common argument. And this is my colleague, Dave Gunkel. Uh, we've known each other for a long time. But, but I'm still upset. And he always bashes my robot should be slaves title. The paper is not actually about that. But anyway, the title. Uh, but anyway, so I'm going to bash him. We can generalize from feminism and the civil rights movement to learn that we need to be careful to extend moral, moral subjectivity behind, beyond what must, might seem obvious. The thing is that women and people of color are human, right? And if you're going to make this argument, then I think that, that the feminism is not done, right? The, the, it's uh, mind boggling. OK, so five reasons not to argue to um, other AI. We are programmed to think humanoid robot, pre-programmed. I mean, Six-month-old babies, did I say this? Yeah, I don't say this. Six-month-old babies already pay attention to humanoid robots. And if you have a box-like robot, they don't pay attention to it. But they, they pay attention to humanoid robot in the same way they do a human. So we're going to think we've, we've succeeded before we have. And that facilitates political and economic exploitation, right? Um, I'll go fast through these in the Q&A. Second order moral patiency, why should we build robots to suffer uh, when they lose social status? We are going to own them. This is where, Ka where Catherine was right. We are going to own them, so why build something that minds being owned? That's nuts. Why? We've already decided as a culture that that's not an OK thing to do. So we're obliged to build ro robots that we are not obliged to. This is an option. We're talking about engineering here. We're not talking about logical possibility. We're talking about what do we consider to be a legal product that can be marketed. I'm not even telling you what you can do as art in your own basement. I'm saying it shouldn't market it unless we aren't obliged to it. This is not a double standard. You can pick any standard you want for moral subjects, then don't build to it. OK? That's engineering. We can do that. All right. I'm going to skip through this because I'm already out of time. I'm just, I just want to say, I like robots. I understand. I like Star Wars, too. And I, 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 I get the emotionally, I get this. I, because I'm a human, too. right? I, I totally get it. We identify with them. But they aren't the same. There's nothing we can do, no matter how great of parents we are, that would make her not damaged by being owned or being subordinated even. So in the civil service, if she winds up at the top of the civil service, she's going to live longer and be healthier on average than if she winds up at the bottom of the civil service. Okay? Robots we build. We can do anything with them. There's no reason that they have two eyes and two hands except to sell, you know, to market them. All right? So uh, Kunkel has recently said that I'm, I'm, I'm preaching asceticism because you know, I'm, I'm telling us to go against our interests, that, that we love 
the idea of having these little humanoid robots. Um, yeah, but that's normal. <laughs> okay? I'm sorry, I'm talking about morality here. <laughs> okay? So we know, we, 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 have, we talked about this with movies. We know that there's fictional characters, and we shouldn't treat actors as if they are the fictional characters. We shouldn't hate the actors that play the bad guys and, and you know, love the actors that play the good guys. Um, so anyway, we can easily make AI's uh, cognitive moral status more transparent if we want to. This is something, it's a research that my students have done. It's, it was published in the IJCHI workshop, and we have a new version that we're hoping to get into CHI. Uh, but all you have to do is show the priorities of the system in real time while it's running around. And we've done this. This is the IJCHI version. It's with video that you see here. Um, the, the version that we put into CHI is, is based in real, li real life experience of the robot. But just seeing that the robot is thinking, just seeing that it has states, helps people get more realistic understandings. And again, you know, science, statistics, whatever. But basically, they get a much better idea of it. They still, they're still wrong. They're still like wildly wrong, but way better uh, if they've had that experience. So I think that's a technical problem that could be overcome if we wanted to, if we weren't trying to deceive people. So yeah, the, the, um, the fear of uh, robot Apocalypse is distracting us from the real threats, as I mentioned, this loss of, uh, of individual autonomy, of variation, um, because of a decreasing privacy. Um, and uh, I actually think this is a huge problem for companies, too. If, you are, if all your leafs are just these programs, then you have lost the capacity to, uh, to, to innovate, where you see that, that you know, if someone comes into the bank and they persistently want something that your tellers can't give them, if you, uh, if you only have a machine there, you don't really see that. Um, actually, one of the really disturbing things now is banks have figured out that people like to talk to people. They put a person there, and then they cut that person off from the upper management by making them fill in the computer screen for you. <laughs> right? So, so it, it's not just about having whether or not you talk to a person. It's whether there's a chain of people up to the decision makers, up to the board. And whenever any place that you have a firewall and break that chain, then you're going to limit your innovation and your ability to, to do uh, useful things. All right, there's this legal lacuna argument. We talked, I think, a bit about this yesterday, that we already have this problem with the legal persons of corporations. It would be way worse with AI, okay? So, um, yeah, I, I, we've talked about that enough, so I'm going to skip through it quickly. And then finally, this was the point that I've been making a lot, so I won't go too much into detail now. Um, what is it, what is that one special magic piece that is that we are human. That's all there is. That's the only thing. Uh, ethics is about maintaining society. All right? There, no, there is no other piece. Um, society defines and enforces responsibility. Enforcement is often through punishment. Evolution ensures that suffering and shame are inextricable parts of being human, also for apes, dogs, any other social species. All right? We can't make that same assurance with AI unless we do that thing where you scan in the brain. And if you scan in the brain, that's going to be useless unless you have also the identical body, and then you have a slave. If you have a clone, you have a slave, and we already know that that's, that's un unethical. All right? So there's no way to ensure that kind of, that kind of uh, suffering that would make us, and so we'd have to totally, I mean, the alternative, this is a recommendation. These are the recommendations. The alternative is radically changing our uh, justice system. All right. So. Artificial and natural intelligence are both uh, attributes requiring computation, which is expensive, the majority of which has been done before. We're just, we're just standing on the shoulders of giants. All right? In nature, morality governs and defines societies, and the recommendation is that we incorporate AI into our existing societies because we've already gone to the trouble of evolving and, and, and then writing up uh, legally and extending these societies. So they're already relatively functional. Um, for millions of years, things like intelligence, consciousness, agency, language, morality, and divinity have been seen as correlated. Um, correlation is not causation. No one of those things is the magic thing that makes the, 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 the legal, the, um, the moral subject. Um, arguably, you could use divinity, since uh, there was mention of God before, arguably, you could use divinity as the thing that, as a term for that, if you don't have another use for it, but anyway. Um, if you define it, for any of these, you can define it and say, that's what I mean by consciousness. OK, then we need another word for explicit memory. OK, we need another word for self-awareness. All right, so yeah, I've already said that. I'm, I'm going to, this is just arguing from authority. It's kind of weak. But the point is that, that Kant showed that 
if you believe the categorical imperative, which is basically don't do things that don't act on laws that you wouldn't want everybody else to act on, then you should also never act as if people are only means. They, of course, are means, but, but other people must always be seen as the end, an end, right? They, they, they matter. All right. So my conclusion is that AI is here now changing the world. IT blurs human agency. Customers do the work for bank stores and airlines. Families have become groups rather than individuals. We should not allow or encourage the use of AI as an ethics sink. And so I think responsibility is complex enough already. And that's why I discourage the othering of AI. Um, but that's a normative recommendation. These two are descriptive. And I think, and I just want to make that very clear. OK, I want to thank the co those are the co-authors on the semantics work. And these are my PhD students. Thank you.